Everything in the visual medium is designed to either attract or get the viewer's attention. The same can be said with backgrounds. It's designed to fit a certain scene or scenario. Because if you think about it, if we were to make a background for animation or games, you will have to start with either a concept or an idea of what the scene might be. You wouldn't want a wedding taking place in a pirate ship under cannon fire, realistically, not unless it's an artistic choice or it fits the theme. Everything you see on screen has a purpose because it's designed that way. Even Andrew Stanton said so. You've gone through hundreds of TV channels just switching after sw channel after channel, and then suddenly you actually stop on one. It's already halfway over, but something's caught you, and you're drawn in, and you care. That's not by chance. That's by design. It's really just up to the artist or the writer's imagination on how to pull it off. So, what made me notice Persona 4 10 years after its initial debut in the PS2? What could possibly be so special about the 10-year-old game that everyone is still raging about it even to this day? Well, I played it and I'm here to answer just that, on what made Persona 4 Golden special for me. A little context for the people who haven't played the game yet, also consider this as your mild spoiler warning. But if you are new and don't know the Persona games, I'm curious as to how you stumbled upon this video. Please let me know. The story is about our main protagonist who is thrown into the boonies by his parents because of job-related issues. The town's name is called Inaba where everything is normal and boring because of its small size and small population. The town is also situated far from the city. This is where we will meet our friends and family. The town's calm and peaceful nature will be disturbed by a series of serial murder cases which the player must help and solve. And that's basically it really. To put it simply, it's like Japan meets Scooby-Doo and Pokemon and I cannot get enough of it. But one major thing to point out is that I never really liked the story. It's great at best, but not 10 out of 10. No, what appeals to me most is how they delivered the story which combines an open world, visual novel, dungeon crawling, monster collection, and life simulator. It's quite different from all of the games that I have played in the past. I'm even going as far as to say that it has its own league. And again, remember, this is a 10-year-old game, developed back in 2008 for the PS2, under the Shin Megami Tensei franchise. So even though it's old, it's still new and different, but I'm hoping that people who are eyeing this game out, there is still time. The game still holds up in 2020 or 2021. It's also very accessible now since you can get a digital copy through Steam or through the PS Vita. At this point in time, you are probably asking what's great about it then? And I have to say, it's the world building. Even though the story is set in 2011, the game was developed back in 2008. And there is a lot of sprinkled items and stuff that you will only find during that time. One tiny detail that got my attention is the food. Imagine it's 2008 and you are in a rural parts of Asia. Well, I can't speak for anyone who lived in the States, but back in 2008, Asia, where flip-up phones, fat and boxy TVs ruled the modern-day media landscape. It's also a time where computers can only be seen in businesses and offices compared to what they are today. Personal computers were not that big back then because not everyone can afford one, and if you can afford one, you're either using it for work or just categorizing files. Those things alone are portrayed really well in this game that it's downright scary. They don't have computers, they have boxy TVs with whack antennas and big televisions are considered to be a luxury even inside the game. What? That's not cheap at all! There's way too many zeros! I should have asked what you meant by cheap right off the bat. Heck, if you observe enough, the household you are staying in doesn't even have a computer. The closest thing that you can call high-tech is probably the telephone and the TV. They go out and talk, chill around, watch movies because there's nothing really to do at home compared to social media, games, and Netflix today. You can compare your lives with a comedy film from 2004 called Napoleon Dynamite which is very similar in terms of their setting. They are both set in a rural area where there's nothing much to do. It looks nice. Yeah, it looks pretty sweet. It looks awesome. It's, it's incredible. Let's take a look at this kind of person because it's awesome. These are awesome people. We're going to show them shopping at their store. This is what they have. They don't have like 
uh, awesome huge stores there in small town Idaho or small towns anywhere. Anyway, back to world building about food. Now, why this stood out to me is because I've seen those crackers before. Back in 2006, while I did not live in Japan, my father worked there, and he would often bring me food that came from the said country. It's different from what we have and it also tastes different too. I still remember that weird UFO instant noodles and that Thomas the Train candy capsules. Yes, it was definitely a weird childhood. But among those foods are something that are completely new and familiar, and it's the Marie Biscuit, this one. We also have our own Marie Biscuit, the contents are the same but the packaging is different. And the moment that I saw its packaging in the Dojima residence kitchen table, I knew right away that it's the same thing. And it gave me this nostalgic feeling that instantly brought me back to my childhood days of 2006. But not only that, most of the food and boxes they use in the Juness department store is also a real thing. I've looked up a few, feel free to pause the video. This is amazing if you are like me who gets to see those old boxes or food. The detail seems small but combined it with the game then it feels more like a 2007 caricature hiding inside a classic game. Now the question is why? Why would the developers choose this type of foods while well, most of the other things in the store are either blurred out or unrecognizable? What are they trying to convey? Does the biscuit have something to do with the story? Is it a plot device? Well no, it's not a plot device. But I noticed something interesting, if you review the products from Juness and the other products in the Dojima residence from Marie Biscuit, Moonlight Cookies, Chocolate Chip Cookies, and Caramel Milk, they all have something in common. They're all manufactured by the same company, Morinaga. If that rings any bells then you already know where this is going. Morinaga company has been in a way involved in one of the most famous unsolved mysteries in Japan. Basically, it's like a serial murder case just like in the game which happened back in 1986. But then again, all of this is just a speculation and none of this is a proven fact. If you're interested in the case though, one YouTube search and you are pretty much set. But wait, there's also a girl named Mari. What does it all mean? Does the biscuit actually mean that the sin of man is ever present in the teeniest of things? Or the sin of man is present in the most innocent way possible? Or, or that the normal things in our life actually snowballs into hiding the truth similar to how the rapper hides its cookies. Moving on, look at this shot from the Velvet Room. Don Perignon Vintage 1958 is one of the most expensive champagne, which suits the overall motif of the place where it's basically a limousine ride decorated by expensive blue velvet. I expect no less from the dwellers of the Velvet Room. One thing that stands out and is probably one of the main reasons that this game is so popular is its colorful set of characters. This game is a gravy train full of memorable character moments. Putting the whole plot aside, every character has their set of story and character arcs to divulge, and whether you discover them or ignore them completely is up to you. The game highly hints at the word truth. It's the main theme of the opening song. The subject can also be found in every main character and scene of Persona 4. Just like the TV world for example, which represents the real world but inside it's clouded by fog which could imply that not everything you see on TV is real or believable. The magazines on Riza's body measurements are also a lie fabricated by her agency to boost her idol status. Even Riza herself is viewed as a lie at one point saying that it's all an act to rake in more supporters and it's not her true self. Kanji's personality is just a facade to make him look more manly in front of society. The Velvet Room is situated inside a fancy limousine and is also moving between mind and matter, which could imply that it's your safe haven from the press and the people. Basically it's all a guessing game on which is real and what is the truth. The game masterfully shifts the story so that you can have answers but in return it will give you more questions. The pursuit of truth is probably the core of this game for me. The thing that appeals to me most is how captivating this set of virtual characters are, because every single one of them is grounded in reality. Just take a look at the daily struggles and misfortunes of Yosuke all throughout the story. It feels really simple but at the same time it feels captivating as well because it's relatable. Going back to the topic of truth on how it all wraps up with the characters, every single one of them is looking for an answer whether that be inheriting the family business, solving his wife's case, why did he have to leave the big city. 
Now, let's take a look at this from a character writer's perspective to better understand other characters a little bit better. According to Tyler Murray in his video about character arcs, he said that characters are built on their want and need. A want is a visible goal of the character. In this case, the whole investigation team wants to catch the culprit, to stop the killings and to bring back the peace in Inaba. But catching the culprit is not what makes them whole or complete because outside of the plot, they have their own internal or external conflicts to deal with. Yukiko with her family business inheritance and expectations, Naoto and her morale and self-doubt in a male-dominated workforce, Teddy about accepting his origins and self-worth, every single one of the characters in this game has this level of detail, and it's up to the player whether you hear them out in-game or ignore them completely. This is where the needs comes in. In his word, the need is what the characters must discover about themselves or the world to become whole or one. Because simply completing the needed plot and capturing the real culprit doesn't really solve their internal issues like self-doubt and jealousy. Aside from those, there's also one single thing that a character might have while pursuing his or her wants, and that is the lie that they believe in. The lie is what stops the characters from achieving what they truly need to become complete or whole. With all of these factors, let's take a look at Yukiko. Her family expects her to inherit and hopefully take over their family inn or the Amagi inn. She is often busy with training and is seen helping out around the inn which resulted in her missing out the fun times with Chie or escaping classes altogether. Her want is to run away from Inaba and pave her own way for her own self and career. While on the surface, this sounds selfish and self-centered, but if you look at it from her perspective, it sounded like her life is being paved by others or is being controlled by her family. The lie that she believes in is that if she runs away from her current predicament and responsibilities, she can avoid all of the expectations placed upon her shoulders. In the game, she said that she wanted to be an interior designer as a career path and is studying on how to live on her own and hopefully one day she can move out of Inaba. But her need or her truth is actually much more closer than she expected. In the later phases of her social link, it's revealed that she confronted everyone at the end and said that she is not planning to take over as manager. But to her surprise, everyone just laughed it off and said that they already knew about it. She ultimately realized how supportive the people around her are, to the point that even though they knew that she does not want to take over as manager, they still supported her throughout her journey. She also realized that she had a choice in the beginning. It's not just about her being shunned into being a manager. She also has a say in all of this. She's also free on what she wants to do, but the choice somehow got clouded along the way, which resulted in her looking for a way out. In the end, she decided to stay and support the people who supported her. One step at a time away from here, every step I use to run will take me somewhere I don't want to be. And if I keep averting my eyes, one day, I might find myself blind to everything. Even her untamed persona design is that of a bird in a cage, but only this time the cage is opened, which could represent that she already had a choice to begin with. The persona is even colored red. Well, Yukiko is colored red. Red is most often associated with the words passion, willpower, and energy, and Yukiko is indeed all of that. She chose to do something instead of just waiting and Yes, she might be confused, but it's not a rushed decision. She is willing to learn what it takes, and even if her cooking is bad and she sucks at reading the mood, she is learning along with her friends. I'm sure I'm not doing any justice in all of this because I'm just summarizing her story as a whole, but if you play through the game, you can see all of her interaction on how and why she realized her own truth. You can even help her learn the basic survival guide for the big city. Again, I think finding out and learning about what these characters want and need is part of the appeal of the Persona series. Outside of the murder mystery or the main plot, the game is about finding truth at heart. Let's take another look at one of the characters. Moving to Yosuke, similar to your case, he also moved to the rural town for a job-related issues. In this case though, he moved because of his father's job as a head manager of the new and upcoming marketplace built in the town. So what does he want? Well, he wants to be special, in a way that's true and genuine, because in the game, he is mostly seen as a nuisance or annoying because of his father's job who disrupts the small community market in the shopping district. If you look at this in the business side of things, if you built a big supermarket that has everything from groceries to electronics, what about the people who own smaller shops that only sells a couple of things? 
With this in mind, they really hated the new establishment and that hate also fell down to Yosuke. He doesn't have that many friends because of that. He also wants to be surrounded by people because deep down he is scared to be alone, combine that with the vibe that he gets around town. It's no secret that he will question why is he even there, and why does he have to put up with his father's job. The lie that he believes in is that he needs to be special to be appreciated and to have people around him. He wants to be acknowledged by anyone or by his friends. He also confessed in the later parts of the game that he is jealous of you on how everyone sees you as someone special or as a leader figure. He puts in effort in everything like coming up with ideas or suggesting risky and bold ones because he believes that doing these things will earn him some reputation. Even if his shadow says that he is doing it for fun because there's nothing really to do in the town, it all stems back to him wanting to be noticed by people and wanting that bond with others. But his truth is actually hiding under his feet because even if he's not the strongest nor the smartest among his peers or in Juness, he has always been doing his best even if it's for his selfish desires. It's actually funny because you can see him being appreciated by you or by others. You can also see him gradually accept people all throughout the story or the game. Even with his jokes and stupid ideas, Yosuke means well and I think is perfect for your partner in the game. I really like Yosuke as a character because it reminds me of one of my favorite shows, Sound Euphonium, which also a show about the struggles of being special, just like Yosuke, and similar to Yosuke, the path to being good and appreciated is a hard and a bumpy one. Another thing about this game is that it's memorable and one of the factors that I love about games is when it's unique enough to be its own genre. And I think it does just that when I think of JRPGs, I think of Persona. And I'm not saying that the other games are bad, it's just that at the end of the day we all have our own favorites and I think to some extent we have our standard when a certain genre is mentioned. Like when people talk about Battle Royale, I will instantly think about PUBG because that's where I and my friends wasted most of our time. Some of you might say Fortnite or Spellbreak, but aside from that one factor that makes Persona 4 memorable for me is its use of colors. Let's take a quick look at its opening. It's a continuous shot from beginning to end and it's like you are peering inside a kaleidoscope and seeing fresh and new colors for the first time. Not only that, the colors they use on the characters also exaggerate their feelings and characteristics. If you look at the protagonist's colors, it consists of gray, black, which ultimately communicates his innocence and purity, a perfect blank canvas for the players to use. You can also see the use of gray and black in his character design. Compare that with Yosuke's orange which screams enthusiasm, youth, and determination. Which again you can find being incorporated in his design both in hair and his headphones. If you play the game you can actually see traits in Yosuke, he's young and stupid but determined to do what's right. I would also like to point out that it's funny seeing him hiding in the trash can. Good job Atlas. Good job. Even Reese's pink atmosphere is not far off in her personality in the game. Her colors scream femininity, love, and playfulness, which is absolutely true given the fact that her assigned tarot card is that of the lover. Her character design is also in line with Yosuke's orange color, which in line with her enthusiasm and youthful nature. She is done and executed really well to the point that when a certain scene happens, I'm curious on how Reese would react. You think that's long enough for a moving hug? Shouldn't you let go now? Nope. I'm tired of moving. Enough with getting up. Good thing there's someone even I can hug. Hey! Here we go again. Why is it all our friends are like this? The story masterfully delivers tiny bits of characters scene by scene and as you go through the story you kind of feel like you know the characters on a deeper level. Kind of like how Chie's tone of voice will go down as she realizes that she is saying something stupid. Risei-chan started saying let's all have fun with this so I didn't really have a choice. Wait, so you saw it too? And we saw the same girl? D does that mean we have the same soulmate? Or how Kanji roasts people without even knowing that he is actually spitting some fire. Wait, Kanji. How come you're not getting a nosebleed over me? Huh? Why would that happen? What? It's these tiny little character moments that truly brings the fun and joy to this game. 
But yes, that's probably it for now. That's my fresh take on the game. It's fun and I totally recommend it to people who are interested in it.